makes you happy in the moment without anything, without a phone, without anybody else, without anyone else, with not being anywhere specific, what makes you happy and what's going to make you happy in 10 years, in 20 years Mm. and get on that path of doing it. And the only way to progress, to keep going forward and moving forward is by optimizing your brain and physiology. You want the best, you want to give yourself the best path and the only way that I know to do that is by treating your brain right first and your physiology. Hi, I'm Louise Nicola, neurophysiologist and brain coach to elite performers. In today's episode, I'm going to be going over the three domains of peak brain performance. We're going to be talking about nutrients for the brain. We're going to be talking about exercise for the brain, and we're going to be talking about sleep for the brain. So tune in. So welcome back. I'm so yeah. excited to be here. Um, last time you were on the show, I'm going to make sure to have this down on the show notes for everybody to check out. You gave us such an incredible breakdown of neuroscience, what it is, how we can really understand not only how our brains function, but why we should actually care about maintaining certain brain function and optimizing it. Um, so they can definitely check out that for the foundational stuff. But I'm curious, I want to ask you, since then the last year and a half, what have you seen just really grab hold in the world of neuroscience? Like why should we care more? Why should we not care more now? Well, okay. I love that you said that because mm. you're right. When we, you know, 90, what was it? Uh, I think 18 months ago. Yeah, yes. yeah. 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 We, we met up and we gave an introduction to the brain and nervous system. Mm. And I think that sets the ground for everything that I believe in. I think that in order to get change in this area, education is the way forward. Mm -hmm. We can't just tell people what to do. You have to know why. Mm -hmm. And since then, so Neuroathletics, my company, we've really solidified how we work with individuals. We work with two types of individuals. It's the athlete and that kind of finance, Wall Street, hedge fund manager Mm -hmm. type. And within within those two types of population, we work in three domains. We work in the nutritional domain, the exercise domain, mm. and the neurophysiology domain. And I'm going to break those three things down for you and for your audience so we can understand how brain health aligns in those three things. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So let's talk about nutrition. The nutrition, I think, you know, there's this, there's this constant feedback and argument, I would say, between people who believe that nutrition comes first. Mm. Some people believe that exercise comes first. In terms of? In terms of brain health. Brain health, okay. okay? And I'm, I'm on the bucket of exercise and sleep, you know, in terms of what comes first. And I'm that, team sleep for sure. Yeah. Well, well, I am too. And that's because when you search any PubMed article and you really dig deep into the literature, it nothing really seems to align until you have sleep down packed first. Mm. So whenever a an athlete comes on board at neuroathletics, when we look at these three domains, we break everything down. We first figure out let's take sleep for example. We do a full on sleep analysis. We may get them into a sleep lab, figuring mm. out how well they're sleeping. And we can find, you know, discrepancies in how many times they wake up during the night, what time they go to sleep. Mm. If they're spending 20% of their total sleep time in REM sleep, we find out everything that we can when it comes to sleep and we work on sleep. So let's, let's start there. Let's talk about I totally sleep. hijacked you from nutrition. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> like, but I, I, I get I, I hear was, sleep and I get so excited. <laughs> yeah, and, you, and I know you love sleep. And I know and you love sleep too. You're wearing a you're wearing a whoop, so mm. I know that you're tracking and measuring mm. your sleep. Sleep is probably the most underrated high performance tool we have. Mm. If you're an athlete and you're not sleeping well, it's going to affect your shooting accuracy if you're mm. an MBA athlete. It's going to affect your reaction time. It's going to affect your attention, your focus, mm. your information processing speed. But it's also going to affect how well you recover. Mm. So when we sleep, well, if we're sleeping well, we're going through four different stages of sleep. We're first starting out in light sleep. We move into uh, a, a stage N2 sleep. Mm-hmm. 
and then we're going to N3 sleep. So these three sleep stages are comprised of non-REM, non-rapid eye movement sleep. Okay. Now during the N3 stage sleep, okay, so this is not REM sleep. This is still deep sleep, okay? Mm. N3 is classified as slow wave sleep, okay? We know it as deep sleep. Mm. Many things happen in here. We get the release of various hormones that are responsible for recovery and protein synthesis. But something wonderful happens then. This system kicks in. I know you've heard of it. It's called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. Those glial cells. Absolutely. So these glial cells, which is actually, um, it's named after a Greek word for glue. Mm. I don't know if you Mm. knew that. I had to chuck that in there because I'm Greek. No, that's a fun fact. Yes. So, And what happens is they, when you go to sleep, these cells kind of, uh, they shrink and they- That's right. They do, they shrink and they leave room for the cerebral spinal fluid to go through- For your brain to take a bath, basically. Yeah, it's like a sewage system Mm. for your brain. So you get the release of many toxins and Mm. they say that, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases because one of the proteins that builds up is called tau proteins. Mm. And these tau proteins aggregate and they clump together and you get dysregulated sleep and you don't get the, mm. you don't kick in with the um, glymphatic system. And it's like this, it's like this, you know, this flow effect, because if you don't sleep well, you don't kick that glymphatic system in. And if you don't kick in the glymphatic system, then you're going to have a higher rate of, mm. you know, aggregating these tau proteins. So it's a, it's a really big flow effect there. So, so that, that probably builds up. I mean, so not only is it a pain point here and now for your sleep quality and quantity, but I'm assuming that can be a potential buildup for brain health disorders, inflammation, yeah. Alzheimer's, dementia. Accelerating, yeah, yeah. Uh, brain health wow, and okay. brain aging. So we need to be sleeping in order to get that, mm. you know, to kick in that system and feel good. You just, you know, mm. I always say when you wake up with brain fog, you, you definitely haven't had a good night's mm. sleep. So that's one aspect. And then we move into that REM sleep stage. And REM sleep is, it's a rapid eye movement sleep. And it's called that because when you do a sleep study, you see these horizontal eye movements on the EEG scan. And that's another wonderful stage. And oftentimes, even for myself, Mm. I find that sometimes I'm waking up with a 14% average REM sleep score. And I Mm. think, why am I at 14%? Because some of the biggest things that kick you out of REM sleep are uh, light. Mm. Okay, I know I don't have light. Alcohol, I know I don't have alcohol in my system. Alcohol is one of the biggest things that completely plummets your REM sleep. Um, And medications. Mm. And I think I'm not on any of those three things. What is happening? It turns out that stress has a major implication on REM sleep. Hmm. So however much stressed you are during the day, it's really going to kick you out of that REM sleep. And REM sleep is, you know, we need a lot of REM sleep. So it's just sitting there waiting, like stress is like, fine, you go to sleep. But I'm I'm going to screw you up. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So we can see, and with a a lot of the content I put out Mm. about sleep, we can see how important sleep is. And when I work with these individuals, when I work with athletes, let's just say in the NBA, I'm noticing a a pattern. Mm. Okay. So a lot of them say, Louisa, when I get on the court, I start to freak out or I start to get Mm. anxious. Okay. So that's one thing I realize. Another thing is uh, from the NBA athletes is during the playoff season, you know, which comprises of several months, they are not sleeping well because they're traveling. Sure. Yeah. Some of them are traveling, you know, you're out of your normal routine. Yeah. Routine. Different time zones, different beds, different hotels. Yeah. Yeah. So they're getting completely dysregulated sleep wake cycles. And that in turn is Mm. creating more ACL injuries. I I, I honestly believe, and and I'm going to get a lot of people attacking me for this, but there are so many people who don't understand that during the NBA playoffs, we see, you know, ankle injuries, we're seeing uh, knee injuries, you know, Achilles tendons, ACLs. More so than the regular season. Yeah. And Mm. does this come down to the way they're sleeping, the way that they're recovering? So it's a really big aspect of sleep right there. Let's move on to nutrition. Mm -hmm. So we love nutrition. We outsource a lot of it. And I'm not a nutritionist, but what I do know is that when it comes to the brain, there are certain things that the brain favors especially as it relates to uh, nutrition and supplementation. Mm. And we have this, we have this barrier around our brain and 
it's called the blood brain barrier. And I always describe it as the bouncer of a club. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. Yeah. yeah great yeah. analogy. Yeah. It says who can come yeah. in and, and who you're can't. cool. You stay over there. Yeah. yeah. And that, and rightfully so, mm. because imagine if everybody could come in mm. and, and every molecule, every molecule could come in. So this wonderful barrier, unfortunately it, it, it breaks down as we age as a natural aging process. But guess what else breaks it down? Stress. Mm. And I think, I, you know, I tweeted this morning, I said that inflammation and stress, suppression of inflammation may be the very key to longevity and cognitive performance. Wow. Yeah. So. I can get on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've got, um, we've got so many things that attacks us on a daily basis when it comes to stress. And it's all psychological. You know, mm. it doesn't have to be a, when you stress out, for example, it could be your brain doesn't know the difference between getting hit by a car mm. or simply, you know, just thinking of something or, or maybe going through a divorce mm. or the loss of a loved one. It's still stress. And there's, uh, there's about seven different pathways that happen in your brain from the moment that you perceive stress mm. to actually, you know, going through the motions. And over time, if we keep doing this, if we keep, you know, thinking stress, seeing stress, opening our phones, you know, notifications, we're getting a breakdown of that blood brain barrier integrity. And that's scary because that is accelerating the aging process. Mm. And it's doing a lot more than that. So we look at that and we think, well, so many things are stressing us out with even lack of sleep, mm. poor nutrition, eating um, low fiber foods, high carbohydrates, a lot of sugar, highly processed, yeah. highly processed, you know, staring at light or through the day and through the night, alcohol, all of these things are aiding in blood barrier, mm. brain, brain, blood, <laughs> blood brain barrier breakdown. There we go. <laughs> well, I just had to go yeah. all bees, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what are the things that we can do yeah. to preserve our brain health when it comes to supplementation? Omega-3 fatty acids. And I harp on this a lot and I know mm. that you do too. And I know that you've posted something about taking a high dose of, e are you taking high dose EPA? Yeah, I, I do. And actually I was going to give you credit. I, I was assuming this would come up um, because of your work and content around this. Um, I've gone from knowing that this high dose omega-3 is good for me to not even optimizing in terms of just the quantity and quality um, because of your work, I now split it up. So I'll do like half dose in the morning and then my second dose in the evening. Yeah. Uh, I try to get it in an hour, with two, no more than two hours kind of before I'm going to bed. So I've kind of got that fresh supply for sleep for all yeah. these things we're talking about. Well, omega-3s are comprised of the EPA, DHA mm. and ALA. And, you know, the ALA is more so, you know, that come the form that forms that come from flaxseed and mm -hmm. chia seeds. So a lot of the vegans, uh, you know, advocate for the ALA, but I'm more so on the bandwagon of the EPA and DHA. One, they cross the blood brain barrier. So mm -hmm. they get in and neural tissue. When you look at the brain, it's primarily comprised of DHA. So why wouldn't we feed it what it's made out Give of? Give it back, yeah. Yeah, so when it comes to dosages, I'm having two grams in the morning and two grams at night. Mm. I'm having two grams of EPA and two grams of uh, DHA. Mm -hmm. And as uh, on par with the scientific literature, that's uh, probably the best dose to have. When it comes to an NFL athlete, mm. I'm dosing them up with at least, you know, six grams a day. And the reason being is they are – predisposed to being hit in the head. Yeah, I was okay. going to ask why. Is it just a performance thing or kind of well, injury? Well, we're trying to giving we're, we're trying to get them prepared like built for disaster, okay. really. Yeah, smart. But, yeah, so a lot of the literature, you know, wh when you look at post traumatic insults, mm. okay? Somebody who's been hit in the head right after post traumatic like literally being hit subconcussive hits or a concussion, the best thing to do is to have a high fat diet. Mm. Okay. So we already want to dose them up on EPA DHA kind of to, you know, bulletproof them, if you will. Yeah. And then getting them on ketones it, really? straight after that. So, yeah. So you're saying uh, like in what kind of time period are we talking about? Literally after the injury? 24 to 48 hours. Okay. So yeah. hear that. 
get a TBI, yep. bump your head pretty significantly. We want to be high fat and then high even fat. ketones. Yeah. So ketones, that's my new, actually, I'm starting to research huh. ketones a lot. So I, I yeah. recently connected with HVMN. I was going to say yeah. the, uh, with Michael Brandt, HVMN, like their work and products in the ketone space have really cracked me open in terms of interest around ketones. And like, I use them now. I, I, I'm not a ketogenic diet guy, but I am amazed uh, at the science behind what ketones are doing for brain health, but yeah. performance and just, you know, my daily wellness. Yeah. So these exogenous ketones, the ones that mm. you're actually ingesting are so good when it comes to even ischemic stroke, when it mm. comes to uh, wow. Yes, yeah, stroke. So I know that they're doing a lot of research when it comes to TBI, but I think it's important to know every time somebody hears the word TBI, they think we're talking purely about the NFL. Mm. You can get a TBI from literally anything, even in soccer, mm. the boys mm. who are headbutting the ball. You know, these tiny little hits can end up being concussions. Yeah, so, I had a seizure years ago. Uh, I was active duty at the time, um, but the TBI was unrelated to my training injury. Uh, I had a seizure, not myself unconscious, TBI. See what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So Epileptics, they're really good yeah. at, you know, helping you safeguard yourself. That was the word I was looking for mm -hmm. earlier. But when it comes to also the EPA and DHA, there's just so many other benefits to it. Mm -hmm. It also helps you lower inflammation. Just in the brain or no, the body in general? Really? Yeah, in the How body so? general. It just... It's, it's what it's, it's, it's what it's thing is. It's what it does. Yeah, it's just what it does. I mean, I can go into I the, mean, I'm sure it, like, the, it has to do, what I'm hearing is like the blood brain barrier. That's really kind of key in a lot of the brain health stuff we're talking about, because yeah. if the right things can get in and if the rest of the things can stay out, then we can allow the brain to not only do what it's supposed to do, but at a higher functioning level. And then that kind of drives the rest of the ship for everything else Yeah, south of the neck. Absolutely. I always say it's, uh, you know, north of neck mm, whenever mm -hmm. I work with somebody. So there, you know, and then we're now starting to experiment with both of our financial, uh, financial athletes, I call them, and mm. our everyday athletes as well. We're starting to experiment with solely a ketogenic diet because it's just, really? you know, and this is something I am new to. I didn't really get into you know, ketones, exogenous mm. ketones. I just thought it was a, a, you had to subscribe to this ketogenic diet. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you know, ever since I spoke to the, the yeah. HVMN guys, they're like, no, yeah. you just can take these. Yeah. You, you've got a higher amount of ketones when you just take this exogenous ketones. Mm. I thought, okay, well, why don't we do that? I started actually with myself. And you know what it did to me? What? It completely suppressed my appetite. So that's. I, I can see that a little bit. Yeah. When, when I take was, mine, I do it in the mornings and I, I'll, yeah, I'll go train and then, yeah, I'm not as hungry nearly as soon as I usually am. Yeah. So I'm loving that. Mm. Okay. And then of course it'd be remiss if I didn't talk about hydration. Mm -hmm. So hydration is probably a really, it's a very big key indicator to performance reaction time, even the way you see the way you perceive uh, objects coming to you how your brain functions, but not just that. If we are, you know, so much as 2% dehydrated, we can have a, a decrease in our cognitive performance by 30%. Wow. And well, he's- Sorry, can you, can you explain what does a 2% really look like? Is that one of these different. or- okay. I mean, it look, it means that if you're a sweater, mm. for example, it depends on how much- I am. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not. You know, it's hard for me, even if I'm uh -huh. training really hard for me to break a sweat that much. Okay. But it depends on how much you sweat. So 2% for you. 2% for you, yes. And that's really significant. Mm. That is really significant as it relates to cognitive performance, how fast you think, mm. how you make decisions. And most of us, almost all of us are walking around a little bit dehydrated, right? Mm, yeah. And it's not just about water. It's about electrolytes. So our brain functions via neurons, mm. nerve cells. They're present in the brain mm. and um, in the spinal cord. And these neurons, when they fire together and create an action potential, they're going across this pump that, called the sodium potassium pump, mm. which is literally electrolytes. Mm. So we need to be feeding our brain what it functions on, mm -hmm. fat, mm -hmm. electrolytes. And I know that I'm seeing a lot of people saying, okay, I'm taking element. I'm taking these, you know, 
hydration oh, yeah. tablets. And that's fantastic because I think we need to understand that just because you're not going out and breaking a sweat, your brain is a hungry organ. Mm -hmm. It's using 20% of the total energy expenditure that you consume. So we need to be feeding it a lot in terms of the yeah. food quality and also the uh, electrolytes. You bring up an interesting point there that I'm sure someone listening can relate to when it comes to taking exogenous ketones, when it comes to taking a fish oil supplement, when it comes to taking an electrolyte supplement. Mm. I'm not an athlete. I'm not breaking a sweat. I'm not doing these things that I'm hearing that people are doing that kind of triggers like, hey, actually you should supplement or you should find them more in your diet. Can you shine a light on why the average person, by average, I mean, maybe you're not sweating, maybe you're not an athlete, the things I just said, why are they still important? Yeah. yeah. I describe this. So when I go and speak at corporate organizations, I describe it like this. Imagine every day mm. that your brain is this cup. Okay. And the cup you wake up and it's full of water and that's your brain's fuel. Mm -hmm. Every time you think, equate that to having a sip of water. Every time that you reply to a text message or write an email, you take a sip of water. Wow. So that is br your brain's energy, just getting sips and sips and sips. Every time you go out and you have to concentrate on driving, mm. you're taking away energy from the brain because it's being consumed by you focusing, by you reacting. So anything other than if we're awake, Absolutely. basically anything other than sleeping. Of course. And of course, Even because during sleep. we need to keep, we need to stay alive. Mm. So, so many things, internal processes are happening when you are awake and the brain is using energy. You know, it's so funny. Do you wake up in the morning? So many of my clients are like, Louise, I woke up and it says my, you know, my data on my whoop says I've already burnt like 800 calories. How's that possible? I'm like, well, because from midnight mm. until 7 a.m., there's a lot of things happening in your body. And so it's a mm. lot of energy that's being consumed. So you are burning calories. You are utilizing yeah. energy. So that's why we need to keep it, you know, we need to keep fueling it. Mm. And it makes sense when you see this cup of water that every time you take a sip. It's a great analogy, yeah. Yeah. So we need to keep topping up that fuel. And that fuel consists of, it consists of mm. sunlight. It consists of sleep. Uh, you're taking sips of water, like all these little daily functions. Yeah, all day and electrolytes. Mm. Yeah. So what about timing? It, I was sharing with you that I've split up when I take my fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, what about timing with electrolytes? What about timing with these other things that are going to be contributing to brain health? No. So we do mm. a sweat test. So we actually measure, and this is not for everybody. Mm. Okay. But I'll give you an indication. So we measure before a game, okay. An athlete's um, body weight, mm -hmm. and then we'll um, get his body weight afterwards. And we'll measure how much he lost in sweat alone. Mm. And we're able to replenish that with electrolytes. But for everybody else, it doesn't really matter about timing. If you're, of course, if you're going to go do a massive workout mm -hmm. and you are sweating a lot, then go through and replace that. But if you're not, and you're just working in an office, mm -hmm. then you might just want to be sipping on, you know, just put one sachet okay. in your bottle, one sachet of element mm -hmm. in your bottle every day and just have that. And that will be, that will be enough for you. So what about, um, I want to piggyback off of that. So yeah. kind of like second level timing stuff. I'm a big believer in my personal experience and what I've studied of the human body over the years that when we wake up to your point earlier, we've already gone through so much. Our, our brain has already burned a lot of calories. Yeah. We're in a dehydrated and fasted state. So for me, first thing in the morning within 30 minutes to an hour tops, really, that's when I'm really going heavy on hydration, electrolytes, micronutrients, just these things that are going to be the best immediate replenishment, uh, as well as um, pre and post workout. I'm looking for certain things. When it comes to things that are going to break that blood brain barrier, when it comes to electrolytes, healthy fats, is the morning after we wake ideal? Is it before workout, after a workout? Does it really matter just as long as we're kind of getting it in throughout the day? It does. But I always, you know, I, I, I am now starting to settle down on putting mm. re these really big restrictions. And I used to be very big on mm. timing and mm. this and that. And I don't think it really matters unless you're LeBron. 
Okay. Okay. If you're and a high, high elite are, performer. Absolutely. Okay. When the margins of error mm. are really, really, really fine. So if you are just an average human, and when I say average, I I'm mean average myself, human. it's, yeah, yeah. you know, and you're not LeBron. Yeah. Timing, un, you know, unless you're going and, and you're really trying to compete for a world title, mm. then yeah, it, it doesn't have to be as strict as possible as long as you get it in. Mm. When I say that, there are differences. So for example, I always say after 12 PM, no caffeine. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's when timing does anything time that has a stimulant effect. Mm -hmm. That's when timing really does come into play. Interesting. Likewise yeah. with alcohol, you know, I, yeah. I don't promote day drinking, but the further away from sleep, I do. <laughs> the further away from sleep you can get, you can get alcohol. That's probably the best. My alcohol consumption over the years has gone down immensely. And, um, and the reason I was joking about, you know, advocating for day drinking is because yeah. usually these days, the last several years, if I'm choosing to drink alcohol, I'm actually way more conscious of the timing of when I'm like the cutoff, you know, I, I will seriously, I used to be like, Oh, let me have a glass of wine with dinner. Let me have a beer whatever. I have to be having a really good bottle of wine, yeah. really good glass of wine. I'll drink a bottle, but you know, or, or like a really favorite beer for me to consider having it with dinner anymore mm -hmm. because you know, I give a lot of credit to wearables, you know, whoop for almost three years. I have a glass of wine with dinner. I have a glass of beer. I'm in the red the next day sometimes. Yeah. And so I, I will, I would much rather have the caffeine, have the alcohol during the daytime so that I can metabolize it and get it out of my system to support the brain health and support the sleep that I need and want. Yeah. And I, I'm the same. So when it comes to alcohol, mm. I've never been a big drinker. Mm. And now if I do occasionally drink, it would be, it would mm. be red wine. Yeah. So what about exercise then recovering, okay. uh, so, the oil, the nutrition? Yeah. So exercise? this is, this is a really fascinating, you know, subtopic and subdomain mm. that we're going to go into. So Around 1999, let's take a, a brief history of the relationship. Yeah. Insert montage here. Let's take a brief history on the relationship between <clears throat> brain health and exercise. <clears throat> In 1999, that was a first study that was done to show the relationship between exercise, mainly aerobic exercise <clears throat> and brain function. What they found was that they put these rodents through six months of aerobic exercise and they found that this grew the hippocampus. Oh, wow. Really? Okay. And they uh, it grew the hippocampus via neurogenesis and neurogenesis is the creation of mm. new neurons. Now there is a lot of uh, speculation of that because as I just mentioned, neurogenesis exists. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't exist in humans. So they found that. So they thought, Oh, this was 1999, which was very big. Hold on, I'm sorry. Neurogenesis doesn't exist in humans? No. It, it, it has not. Yeah, no, it has not been. Um, what? Yeah. Really? Yes. So the creation of, of new, new neurons, of new brain cells doesn't. You're not, blowing my mind right now. Yeah. What? I know. It's a, it's a very big misconception that people do believe that neurogenesis exists in humans uh, when in actual fact it doesn't. Okay. I'm going to need you to. Crack that open in a second. Um, okay. We'll go back to your exercise yes. story. But that's so okay. That was 1999. So they thought, well, this is mind blowing. We can literally create mm. new brain cells via exercise alone. Okay. Fast forward. Okay. Then we went to, there was a big break and mm. it was 2017. And they did a another study. And what they found, this was again done on exercise and brain health. Mm. And what they found was that, wow. We can starve off Al we can starve off Alzheimer's disease by 20 years. So they found a relationship between Alzheimer's disease patients and exercise. Wow. Yeah. Go to 2019. Harold et al. done mm. a wonderful systematic review. He pulled together, he wanted to get to the bottom of the relationship between brain health mm. and physical activity. He pulled together all of the studies that were done. And he wanted to have a focus on resistance training. And what he found was that resistance training does far more for the brain than what mm. aerobic exercise does. Okay. I'd like to hear okay. that. He found that certain hormones, myokines are released during resistance training. And we can go into those mm. that are released that can cross the blood brain barrier and have an effect on cognitive performance. And so that was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And then in 2021, 
there was an RCT done. RCT is the gold standard in academic research, mm. and it was a clinical study. So it was done on humans, and they f- what they did was they took a bunch of mild cognitive impairment patients. So MCI is a pre dementia state. Okay. Okay. So they got. So this con- is a diagnosis. Yes. Or just they yep. meet certain criteria. My, yeah, you okay. have to meet certain criteria. So mild cognitive impairment, and. What they found was they got these people and they put them through six months of resistance training. Mm. And what they found was they grew the area, they grew the connections, okay, not the neurons. They grew the connections around the hippocampal subregions. Mm. So they formed new connections. So this was huge. They also saw, again, that they can starve off Alzheimer's disease mm. by 20 years from resistance training alone. So what they saw in the mice, they're now seeing in humans. In humans, absolutely. Wow. But the mice was aerobic, mm-hmm. okay? Humans, it's not aerobic, it's resistance so training. mice were on the treadmill, humans were, were lifting some weights. We're lifting some mm-hmm. weights. Um, and so this was just mind-blowing. And so what we see when it comes to, let's just focus on resistance training now. Mm. What we see is we see- we see a couple of things. First of all, we see functional brain changes. Functional means the way that your brain is functioning. And we can see this mm. through functional MRI in like EEG. How it's scans. literally lighting up, operating Absolutely. How, on demand with certain tasks. Okay. Yes. Cognitive functions, right. etc. They also see structural changes. Structural mm. meaning the way that it's structured. It turns out that you can grow. So the gray matter of your brain, where mm. the, the, the brain is comprised of white matter and gray matter. Mm. You can grow the gray matter of your brain of your brain by physical activity alone. And that is mind blowing. And I think the percentage I posted on social media is 80%. No, why is that important? Why is oh it why is gosh. it good to grow gray matter? Well, let's talk about um, some of the the theories of the aging process. Mm. So this there's many different theories of the brain aging process. Mm. And one of them is as we age, we lose, we have uh, dysregulation in our white matter integrity. Mm. So like I said, we've got gray matter, we've got white matter. White matter houses all of our myelinated neurons. Okay. Okay. Things such as think of cognitive functions. Like the things that we do repeatedly or yeah. habitually enough that there's coding. Yeah. The myelin sheath is just like, I always think of the analogy of like, you got a set of wires and it's got more insulation around yeah. it. So it increases yeah. conductivity, faster connection, more on demand. There like you that. go. And then our gray matter is, you know, the, it's like the cortex. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I always describe it as I get everybody to put their hand, their right hand in the air and get the palm of their hand and put it on their forehead. And I said, that's where your prefrontal cortex lives. There we go. Yeah. So, um, if we can grow the gray matter of our brain structurally and functionally, we can just do so like that is just mind blowing through exercise alone. Mm. So what are these myokines that are, what are these hormones? Well, the first one is what the researchers found was that when you participate in, um, you know, concentric muscle actions, mm. like a resistance training, you get the release of IGF one insulin growth like factor Mm -hmm. one. So it gets released from skeletal muscle and it acts on metabolic pathways Mm -hmm. and endocrine pathways, Mm -hmm. okay? If it's acting on these two systems in the body, that means we have a a direct and an indirect effect on brain health. Mm. That's the first thing, that's one. Then there's this other wonderful, you know, so many hormones are, are released, cathepsin B, mm. um, interleukin-6. But then there's this other hormone that I'm going to bring up. It's called irisin. And it was founded mm. in 2012. And it's responsible for, it acts like a messenger. And when researchers found this, they called it irisin after the Greek god Iris, who was a messenger to the ah, gods. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So irisin mm. is wonderful. It's also released. It's a myokine that is released from skeletal muscle. That one actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. Okay. So we're doing a workout yeah. consistently enough times to allow this to happen, or is it just whenever we're no, strength training? you get a massive, a rapid release. So just strength training once. A strength just one, you know, wow, after one amazing. day. So- Here's the thing though, you have to, you have to hit a certain load. You can't just mm. go and, and lift a one pound dumbbell. Right. Okay. You have to lift at, and I believe the, 
the recommendations is 70% of your one RM, one repetition max. You have to be doing this mm. at least three times a week mm. to get the effects, the neural effects. And you have to keep putting demand. And I relate this back to if you want your bicep to grow, you have to put it under pressure. Okay. I've been wanting to grow to, for 15 years. <laughs> you have, but you have to train it really, really yeah. hard. And so when you train it really hard, you put it under stress, mm. it grows. It's, it's kind of the same mechanism of action, right? You need to stress those pathways mm. for them to have an effect and for you to release those, those hormones. Mm. And I think that that is just, it's really mind blowing as it relates to longevity. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, you know, skeletal muscle is a longevity organ. It's an organ. And we, we see this mm. in, um, in studies of centenarians. We mm -hmm. see this now where I think we're just touching the surface as it relates to, uh, the elderly and mild cognitive oh, impairment, yeah. brain health. Um, Are you familiar with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon? Yes. She was just in here a couple of weeks ago okay. and breaking down just things that I'm like, okay, cool. I probably know this, but just the way that she was explaining, um, skeletal muscle, protein, t uh, muscle tissue and longevity was just fascinating. Like I never, yeah. I, I never realized how vital maintaining, I, I know strength training is important and, you know, it has so many other benefits, um, but just it's direct correlation and causation with longevity and frailty, just presenting protein and muscle in a whole new light was incredible. Yeah. And, you know, there's a premise that we go into the gym to get, you know, to get fit and mm -hmm. to get healthy when we should be going into the gym for brain health because yeah. the brain really comes first. It's neural first. It's mm -hmm. not muscle first mm -hmm. because in order to, uh, you know, produce a muscle action, yeah. a, a bicep curl, it's neural. It's a, you know, it comes from the Gotta brain. That they mind muscle connection. Where do you think the mind <laughs> gets its the, juice from? Yeah. They send yeah. The, the message down the brain and it tells you to perform that action. So, Yes. And, and, and I really love, um, I really get, love Gabrielle and, and, and her work and when she speaks about, you know, it being a longevity organ mm -hmm. because it really is, but it's also aiding now in so many different other things like cognitive performance. It's helping starve off Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease by 20 years. It's helping with mitochondrial biogenesis, wow. the creation of more mitochondria, which we know is healthy, vital the aging process. Yeah. And also something that we don't you know, I, I didn't know this and I didn't really understand that, you know, people didn't get this, but we have mitochondria in our brain as well, evidently, because we have neurons and mm. neurons are brain cells. The difference between a cell in your body mm. and, and the brain cells is our brain cells have dendrites that come mm. off them because they connect with one another and they synapse. So we have mitochondria in our brain. And there was a recent study done actually showing that the more stressed you are, it actually affects the mitochondria in the prefrontal cortex. Wow. Yes. So we've got four lobes of the brain mm. and the front, the, the, the right at the front, which is where we, we put the hand mm. up before, that's the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe houses the prefrontal cortex. And that prefrontal cortex, you've heard of it as mm. the CEO of our brain. It holds all of our decision-making and our executive functions. Mm. So if we are losing and we are breaking down the mitochondria, in our prefrontal cortex, we're going to be opening ourselves up to mm. a decline in our decision making, a decline in our information processing speed. If this, if we look at the um, CEO of a of a business mm. or a bank, they're going to be making wrong decisions. I've got clients who come to me and say, "Louisa, if I make one wrong decision, I could cost a family ten million dollars." Mm because their entire life savings is with me in my hands. So they have to be performing at their peak. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of stress, a lot of stress. which is why we're, we're now in your athletics mm. is now on wall street. One thing that comes to mind for me is just like, I, I want to drive this home for the listeners that viewer. Um, this is like a whole new level of why for staying fit for mm. regularly exercising strength training in particular. Um, it, you know, over the years, your, your motivation probably dips. I, I think most people have gone through seasons of motivation of, I know this is good for me, but I don't want to go. I'm bored. But just to think about this now, what you're saying of, all right, if I go, I'm going to have this incredible benefit for my brain health that is going to happen here now today. And especially, you know, God forbid anybody have, you know, Alzheimer's in their family, dementia, 
type three diabetes, you know, any kind of neurological degradation like that in the brain, just to know that you can actually do something about it is a whole nother level of motivation. You said something, the word motivation. Mm. Okay. It comes from this molecule, dopamine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Turns out that remember how I was speaking about the, um, the many theories of the brain aging process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the theories is a dysregulation in dopamine receptors, meaning that as we age, we have a lower efficacy mm. of dopamine that is released. So that's why motivation is harder as, so we have to push harder. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, that's an interesting concept. I know uh, we both fanboy over uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman. Yes. Um, I was I fangirl over her. Though. Yeah, excuse me. <laughs> I fangirl too. That's how hard I fanboy. Um, he, uh, he, I think it was like a, a clip or something from a recent interview, um, just talking about, you know, we're talking about ways to contribute to brain health. Here's a unique thing that actually, I think all of us are experiencing that is taking away from brain health mm. and dopamine being the key word. If you find yourself, I'm going to butcher his phrase exactly, but you find yourself kind of aimlessly scrolling. Um, you don't really, all of a sudden you're like, where am I? I don't really know why I'm on here. I'm just scrolling, not staying on anything. He's saying that that is actually a sign that you are in a dopamine loss. Yeah. Like you're, you've exhausted dopamine levels so much that you're just passively looking for a hit, looking for a hit, looking for a hit. And you know, the, as great of a tool this is, um, that is something that we can use to learn about brain health items, but we're losing brain health. We're losing potential. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, dopamine is so fragile and it can go away so fast. But it's also um, how fatigued your brain is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think back to when I was a triathlete, a full-time triathlete. This was before Insta – well, I mean, Instagram probably did exist. I'm not that old, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't on it. I wasn't mm -hmm. on my phone. Mm -hmm. I was just, you know, I'd go home and get on the computer maybe mm -hmm. and look at Facebook. It was a different world and I was so hyper focused. And I, I wonder why I was, maybe I, obviously it was 10 years ago, so mm -hmm. I was younger, but it was, there was, there's still something to add when it comes to social media and it's scary. So mm -hmm. I actually delete the Instagram app off mm -hmm. my phone. So it's on my iPad and I can't be scrolling when I'm out. Yeah. So I think that's done a really big thing for me. What are some other ways maybe we can be mindful of exhausting our dopamine, um, whether that's to take back control, something as simple as deleting an app, you know, yeah. how can we be more aware of where and how we are losing dopamine to maintain dominion over it in our brain health? Well, remember I spoke to you about the seven pathways of stress that our brain. Right. Yeah. yeah how, so it turns out that the science says that if you can stop yourself or put a halt mm. at the very first pathway or any time or within any time that you feel stressed psychologically, mm. you put a stop to that process. Okay. Like what does that look like? So for example, they showed that the number one way of doing this is via Tetris. Okay. The game? The game. I just, so I, you know, I, I downloaded it. Hmm. And so it turns out that if you can have, if you can switch your mind into a completely other mental task, then you are switching off that stress response. Wow. Okay. And the reason I say that is because if you're going to switch that off, then you're not going to be feeling as mentally fatigued. Right. Yeah. So, and that's really interesting, right? Because if you are going through any stressful moment, how, how much do you want to, just bathe in it and overthink it and just keep going. And it's really hmm. difficult. Just want to stay stuck in it because you we think we can find it. the solution. And you just want to keep hmm. going. And, and I do this hmm. too. I, I, it's funny cause it's, you know, I had this realization. It's like, well, that's what, that's what mental toughness is. Do you have the fortitude and the hmm. mental toughness to just nip it in the butt and just put a stop to it? and just go completely the other way. And that's hard. So if you can't do that, if you find yourself digging deep and going into and overthinking and, and just tearing it apart and you don't have the ability to stop and just mm. refocus, then you stop and play Tetris. Hmm. And so is it really Tetris or is it just need to find something we that- need you to know, find something, but like they found that- Very simple, like A plus B equals C kind of thing. Yeah. Well, they 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 used Tetris okay. in the study. That's why I mentioned Tetris. Interesting. But Tetris is, is I've if you put it on your phone, I haven't played it in like 10 years, maybe Since 20 years. Since it was years. on my like TI-83 in high school. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. 
But if you play it now, it really is. It's like you have to concentrate because mm. they, these blocks are going everywhere. So it consumes you mentally. Mm. And so you have to find something that can consume you that it's not just a TV show. Mm-hmm. It's like, or something on Instagram. And what other ways do you think us, the everyday, everyday person, not LeBron James, um, what are some other avenues that we are exhausting our brain health? Where are these holes in our ship when it comes to our brain health that we can look to as easy or easier kind of plugs to, to optimize? Well, if we are sleeping well, mm. let's say we're using Mother Nature's gifts. We're sleeping well. We're hydrating. We're not dosing up on sugar or mm. alcohol. We're doing the right things that we already know. What else can we be doing? We can be viewing natural sunlight. Mm. I always say take a 10-minute stimulation break, okay? At all hours of the day, you are getting stimulated via your eyes, your ears, your skin, everything. If you can just take 10 minutes and close your eyes and breathe, okay, that is one of the best things that you can do. You literally will be taking yourself out of that sympathetic state, Mm -hmm. activating the parasympathetic state and stake state Mm -hmm. and just completely just decompressing. That's one thing that we can be doing. And then if you are, one practice that I've been doing is I've been writing I don't call mm. it journaling. I I rather just call it just, you know, it's like mental dumping mm-hmm. onto a piece brain of paper. Brain dumping, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say it all the time, yeah. And that's because your brain really does want to get everything out. Mm. And instead of putting that on somebody else, instead of just wallowing in it and going down that well, mm. put it on paper and then put that paper to rest. Close the book up, mm. put it to rest. That's a really, that's probably something, that's my the thing that I've been doing this year. It's good to get it out. Yeah, it's absolutely. Good it's, it's good. To, if not, it's just going to stay up here whirling around. Like just a, a release can be incredibly powerful. Yeah. And then I think one thing that we have to talk about is mm. just getting that social interaction because ever since, you know, I was working, mm. uh, I was working in a, in an office, uh, before COVID. So I was working in a neurology clinic, I should say, doing EEGs, um, and seeing patients. And that was, and then COVID hit. And then mm. obviously we closed down the office for, you know, two or three months. And I never went back. I went to working from home Mm -hmm. and I lost that social interaction and that plays on your brain health as well. So getting that social Mm -hmm. interaction is also a really key thing, getting the right social interaction. I was going to say the right one is crucial. Uh, Can you maybe explain a little bit more other than the obvious reasons of it's good to see people, it's good to get out of the house. Like, can you break down for us a little more specifically, why is it good for your brain health to interact, to have quality relationships, quality interactions? Well, there's many different neurotransmitters, these chemicals in the brain that get released at various times, and we can get it from anything. Mm. You know, the way we get it is completely independent. But there is a lot to say about this psychosocial interaction that your brain feels this kind of safety net when you uh-huh. speak to another person. Brain love safety yes. in all areas of health. But also when you are in the presence of another human. So yeah. it does help to speak to somebody on the phone, but it also wants to know, it also wants to feel that when you are mm. with another person in this vicinity. So that's another reason why that, you know, social interaction is a, is a very big thing. But it yeah. comes, also it comes in many forms. It comes in the romantic form. It comes in the friendship form. Mm. It comes in, you know, are you getting a, the love from your mother or your father? Like, where are you getting that from? Love with and for and from yourself. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so since we, last had you on the show. Um, I don't know if it's just personal awareness, but I've seen neuroscience, brain health kind of really skyrocket. skyrocket. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and great. which is great because I'm like, cool, like another resource for me to check out or, or a resource for somebody else to learn. But since you are the expert here and you live in this world, where maybe, where should we be mindful of neuroscience, brain health information or misinformation? Huh. How do we can how can we dissect this other than coming to you of course? Look, that's a that's a huge field. I just interviewed um, Lane Norton. Oh yeah, and um, and Legend. we had yeah. it ended up going on for two mm. hours. That's and it we with were, Lane. <laughs> look, we were having a really big yeah. discussion on you know scientific efficacy and what is right. And when it comes to science, you know, when you go to school and you learn about clinical epidemiology, mm. which is how do you you know how do you 
learn what a research study is. Mm. It takes a long time. You know, that was a six month mm. unit. So it takes a long time. And I'm seeing a lot of people and so is Lane and going on and just butchering science and just pretty much saying that, mm. oh, this study says this, therefore it should be correct. And so it's scary. Mm. And I, I think it's like, how do you know who to follow? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's a good point. How do you trust people in this space? Exactly. Yeah. I think if, and that's why I mentioned we opened up with education. Mm. If you can educate yourself on what it means to be scientifically valid, mm. what is a research study? And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, Louisa, we're not going to go do that. Who do we follow? I think you just have mm. to, it's a, I can't tell you who to go out and follow, mm. but I would say this, if you do see something and you think, oh, I should be doing that, mm. go through and look at all of the different avenues, the pros, the cons, go on trust, Google. Trust, but if you verify. Have to. Absolutely. Have to, yeah. yeah. Because you can't just trust somebody that you don't know. It's mm. like, you know, it's just, you have to do your own homework as well. Other than um, maybe getting certain biomarkers tested, blood panels, or even an EEG scan, how will we know the things we're doing to improve or maintain our brain health? How will we know they're actually working? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question because unlike personal training, your I think everything exists in how you feel. Mm. Yes, you can go and do a you can go and do blood work and you can see oh look my you know, my CRP the, my um, inflammation has mm. gone down. Yeah, actually, let me piggyback off my own question real quick since you're going there. What are things in blood work that we could be looking for, asking for, for brain health optimization? Well, I would first look at genomics-based medicine. Mm. Okay. That is having your genome tested, having a mm. look at your genetic makeup. Okay. Because you could be possessing alleles. Okay. So mm. we have two alleles, one from mom, one from mm. dad. And like, for example, if you possess um, the ApoE4 gene or one allele, then you are more predisposed to getting Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And so that's why I think that there is so many different um, things that you could be testing. Mm. There's one SNP called, um, SNP SNP, called tumor necrosis factor alpha, mm. TNF alpha. And this predisposes you to ischemic stroke. And wow. yeah, so understanding- it's fascinating first, we can know these things now. Oh, it's, uh, yeah. so if you can go through- and do a genetic test, mm. go through and then do a blood panel. Mm. And when you're doing these blood panels, there's so many different things. Like gone are the days when you just go through and do the regular things. You know, mm. you go through, you know, 20 years ago, the doctor would just take your blood and be like, yeah, you're, you're healthy. Mm. In other words, you're not going to die right now. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they might not be checking, like they might not be doing a full on lipid panel, mm. like LP little a, you know, LDL, HDL, like like particles. Like you've really got to deconstruct it. There's about a hundred different biomarkers that you can get tested. I'm floored at the amount of primary care providers now that don't even in like your annual physical labs, don't even get like a C-reactive protein yeah. in there. It's fascinating. Yeah. And now- Not in a good also, way. Yeah. And then we've also got the, um, we've also got wearables now mm. where you can- well, yeah. in levels and like some. Are you other wearing things. a? Continuous? Not right now. No, okay. I'm not. Yeah. So you know, there's things like that we that we can be getting, but we now have. So when I spent time, you know, and I was working in neurology, I was doing so many pre dementia patients, mm. and we were doing um, tests of we're doing brain health checks. You know, we're doing reaction time, memory tests. Why are these not included in the physicians? T you know, when you go and just do your regular mm -hmm. checkup. So I think we should be doing that testing your reaction time, testing your brain, your information processing speed. And that's what we do in your athletics. Mm. We do a brain scan. We figure out how well your brain's functioning. We also do the genetics test, mm. blood biomarkers, and then we've got a fully, sounds like a pyramid. It's like we're right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now we understand mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm. So if you, you know, you can check it via your blood work to see mm. if you're getting better. You can then check it via your, um, if you do a, a reaction time test or you do a memory test, you can check it that way. Are these things that we can be doing at home? Um, you know, what are some like simple tests we can do at home to check reaction time, response time, cognition? Yeah. So neuroathletics, we've got our own, I call it our proprietary brain body method exercise. You can literally, do you know that there's studies that show it's, it's under the bandwidth of neuromotor training. Hmm. Okay. That show that even if you're doing 15 minutes of open skilled training, such as getting two tennis balls and throwing them against the wall, you can also grow the gray, ma gray matter of your brain. It was uh, a 2016 study in uh, the journal Nature. No, is that just because we're 
actively well, using both sides of our brain? Like, uh, well, or, you've or, got hand-eye coordination, okay. you're gripping it, you've, um, you've got reaction time, mm. you've got um, information processing speed, you've just got so many different cognitive functions that wow. are happening that you don't think of. And we've been doing that in neuroathletics. Wow. Many, we've got over 150 different variations. We also That's combine so cool. that with, yeah, we've got light training. So we mm. work with fit light and we've got the reaction training lights happening. Actually, that's mm. something that we should, you know, even talk about because I think using reaction training lights is another big phenomenon in- Yeah, what do you mean by that? What is that? Uh, so fit light is uh, probably, it's like at the forefront right mm. now of neuro training. So they're reaction training lights. And if you looked at these 10 years ago, you'd think, oh, these are good for soccer players or, you know, basketball players to improve their reaction time. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding now is that you can do so much more with these. You can combine these with, you know, throwing skills and can add to the neural pressure in your mm -hmm. brain. It can add to these cognitive domains. Wow. You keep adding pressure and, you know, we can have an effect on brain health. It's just another muscle we can train. Yeah. Um, I do want to go back to this very bold statement of we cannot have neurogenesis in humans. I've never heard that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've heard quite the opposite. I've even said the opposite, certain yeah. things like certain foods, certain supplements, uh, certain th things, um, you know, even uh, psychedelic experiences. You know, I, I look at psilocybin, I look at MDMA, ketamine. I look at things like lion's mane, functional mushrooms. I look at things like MCTs, all these things but that lion's say mane, neurogenesis. Uh, well, I don't, I don't think Lion's Mane has ever said neurogenesis. I believe it I've, said the um, connections. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now you're giving me some homework, yeah, but I, I know I for actually, sure, especially in like ketamine therapy, I mean, that's a driving force in one of the Well, this is a really matters. good thing to talk about because when you look at these studies and if you are in fact looking at these studies, mm. are they done on humans? Because interesting, yes, we, I, I don't at the know end of the day, head, yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, we aren't rodents, mm. and I'm really happy that actually Andrew Huberman put mm. out um, a, a statement saying that there is has not been anywhere, um, n nowhere has it been proven in humans yet, in mice, yes. So okay. when you're looking at these studies, because I'm, I, I'd be, you know, I, I would love for you to yeah, send yeah. me um, an article that states that you can grow new neurons. I mean, this is just all that I've, again, maybe this is shining a light on me and like how I might be looking at misinformation and not accurately reading studies and things of that nature. But I, I, I'm blown that, you know, neurogenesis is not actually happening. So yep. if it's not well, neurogenesis, then, then what is just this other sensation? It's, uh, it's the connectivity. The connectivity. Okay. So the, um, the connections mm -hmm. between, so like I mentioned earlier, these hippocampal subregions growing the connectivity around that. So the way that huh. one neuron responds to the other, let's think about it like this. Mm. You've got around 80 billion neurons. If you could grow new neurons, new neurons, mm via neurogenesis, don't you think we'd have huge brains? Now, don't you think there'd be people out there just doing this as a sport? Because new neurons would mean, hey. Sure. And what would the yeah. cap be? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, it- Would it be 200 billion? It definitely and plays into like is, an evolutionary aspect, you know, yeah. how long would it take for humans to, to do this and to, to you know, have a, a phenotype really. And this is why when you have an ischemic stroke or an infarct, okay, uh, cerebral infarct, let's say that you've, um, you've had a stroke and you've killed off some mm. of those neurons. They don't grow back. It's the regions around that, that really, yeah, yeah it's become stronger. Mm. So that's why brain health and killing off neurons is insane. This is why NFL is insane to me. Mm. Yes. I work with these boys. It's still insane to me that you are voluntarily going out mm. and choosing to get hit in the head because no matter at what velocity you get hit, mm. you are still getting hit. It, so voluntarily choosing to kill off brain cells is ludicrous to me. Mm. Well, I definitely have some new homework when it comes to this term of neurogenesis and um, what it takes, what it could take for humans to actually not just improve the conductivity between these brain cells, but to grow new ones. Um, you're blowing my mind right now. It's, it's, That's it's what wild. I do. 
Um, <laughs> what, so what's on the forefront then? So other than uh, <laughs> blowing everyone away about neurogenesis isn't really a thing yet in humans, you know, what's on the forefront of neuroscience, brain health? What do you see because you're in it so much every day, what do you see as like, oh, we're making such good progress in brain health in, in these ways, therefore it could or even should lead to this kind of experience? So I am very excited about two fields, the gut microbiome field. Mm. field. There is a lot to say about a leaky gut and how it um, goes in and breaks down the blood brain barrier. That's So that's one field. Mm. The other field is what you mentioned, the psychedelic space. Mm. There's only so much that I can do on a daily basis. So I'm, you know, I, I, I'm currently getting a board certification in intraoperative neurophysiology, meaning mm. when you do neurophysiology during surgery. So my time is very, it, it's taken up by wow. studying that so much. So I don't have time and I try and stay in my own field, but I know like there is a lot of research that's being done in these two fields. So hopefully next year I'll, I'll be able to research more about the gut. That's kind of, ex it's, it's actually very exciting to me, the mm -hmm. gut as it relates to the brain. And yeah. And I know that you're really excited about psychedelics. Yeah, I am very excited very. about psychedelics uh, and from a, a clinical application, you know, I, you know, even recreational, but you know, for me, it's always been intentional recreational because of the experiences that I have mentally, emotionally, but like the way that I feel, yeah. like, I, I, I have such more clarity of mind. I, I feel like I have, I feel like I up the Ram in my laptop, you know, it's just the ability to just access things, think about certain things has just significantly improved. Um, that coupled with uh, just other modalities like shout out wave neuro, uh, I've just become so much more curious about how can I measure these things? How, you know, I know I can hop on the scale. I can get my body fat mass percentage, body fat, skeletal muscle tissue. Now we have ways like the wave neuro to actually scan our brains and to measure the composition, the performance. So I feel like science has at least in my experience, the last couple of years really brought to the table, a lot of new modalities to test, to train and to optimize something that used to just be improve your healthy fats, stay hydrated, sleep better. You know, yeah. those are all great foundations for sure. But you know, I'm looking for that little fine tuning. Yeah. How are you fine tuning these days? Oh, I'm I mean, doing a lot. So yeah. I am doing a lot of neuromotor training mm. on a daily basis. I perfect my sleep every night. Mm. So right now you can tell I've got a bit of uh, allergies I was uh, mentioning earlier. And so I'm high. I just do mm. anything like, so I'm flying to Australia in two days. So my entire protocol is changing. Mm. So I'm doing a circadian rhythm protocol. I'm going to be hydrating extra, extra well. I'm going to be doing on Friday because I leave, 11 p.m. So I'll be doing um, sauna, ice bath that day, anything to bring down the inflammation before I get on the flight. It's a 15 hour flight. Whew. Yeah. Damn. Um, well, it's been so good having you back here. Um, your expertise and your passion for understanding how this thing works upstairs um, in a very, very scientific application, a very, very air quote here, real world, everyday person application is incredible. Um, and what I love most about your work and you know, the whole world of neuroscience is that through a few small ways, we, the everyday human being, we can optimize our brain. And in doing so, we're really optimizing everything else. Yeah. And in doing so, I always make this analogy of like the person, like until you start prioritizing your health and wellness, you don't know what good feels like. <laughs> yeah. Now with brain health items such as sleep, healthy fats, just optimize, optimize, optimize. It's just even like 1% better. Mm. And my brain health practice translates, I feel like 20%, 30% yeah. in, in real life. I agree. Um, it's fascinating. I agree. I always say that uh, you are literally, literally leaving money on the table every time you are stressed. Mm. So, um, well- I want to ask our final question here okay. and um, in optimization and fine tuning our life, I feel that helps propel us forward. That's the whole concept, you know, here to live a life ever forward. Um, I don't recall your answer last time. I'll have to cue it up. Maybe I'll have a comparison, but those two words, what do they mean to you ever forward? How do you live a life ever forward? 
I don't know what I said last time. And I don't know if it's changed, but I'm sure it has because <laughs> you've changed. We all have. Uh, yeah. I think ever forward is if we are going to keep moving forward, it's understanding. First of all, it's focusing on what you want mm. and mm. really what you want, what makes you happy in the moment without anything, without a phone, without anybody else, without anyone else, with not being anywhere specific, what makes you happy and what's going to make you happy in 10 years, in 20 years mm. and get on that path of doing it. And the only way to progress, to keep going forward and moving forward is by optimizing your brain and physiology. You want the best, you, you want to give yourself the best path. And the only way that I know to do that is by treating your brain right first and your physiology. And you will definitely be able to keep moving forward to that, mm. to whatever it is that that goal is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, so you got a fan in me have since I found you and your work and, um, just, I, I love, and I appreciate people like you who not only have an area of interest and expertise, but you don't stop there. It's just maintenance, but then what else, what yeah. else? And I think the more and more we push and train our brains, we realize the more potential that we have we can create more things. We can connect more dots. We can realize correlation causation of all these things. So I, mean, I think the work that you're doing is, is paramount. Likewise, Chase, thank you so much for having me. Very welcome. Thank you so much. Bye.